just going to, before I hit the down and start, I'm going to say the, uh, the natty brick background, which for most people merely lends a kind of edgy veneer of street. For me, it's potentially quite confusing, so uh, I've no idea how it's going to pan out yet, but we'll see how we get to So I'm going to talk about the homes of the future. I wanted to say okay for him to do that this time. Well, I've got feedback instead, I've got it. So the, um, the future of housing, of course, itself has a very long history. And for over 100 years, architects have been dreaming of uh, technologically advanced super homes rolling off a production line just like Model T Fords. The grim reality, of course, after the Second World War was about high rise and big panel concrete construction. But even with, uh, even with massive public backing, it never realized savings of time or cost compared to traditional construction. <clears throat> and so for the past 50 years, the construction industry has just really dabbled with factory built homes and seems to be stuck on a kind of panelized flat pack approach, generally using quite traditional timber frame technology. So what has the super digital age got to offer? Well, of course, inevitably, we were already experimenting with 3D printing of entire buildings. This example here, focuses on 3D printing's ability to create intricate shapes and curves. But when you scale the thing up and apply it to much more useful, relatively flat, simple forms for, for residential buildings particularly, it makes me think more of uh, those big uh, concrete tower blocks, perhaps than it does of the homes of the future. Concrete, of course, is also quite a difficult material in terms of sustainability. It's very heavy to move around either for whole houses or pieces of houses. Some people will say, well, we can just print it on site using a mobile rig like this one in the picture. But if you're going to do that in the wind and the rain, well, perhaps piling up bricks and water doesn't look such a weird thing to do. Timber frame, the Wiki House project has had a lot of attention over the past couple of years. Um, it's very much in beta version, but the idea is they have what they call an open source set of details, which you can use to configure a house to your own requirements. And then at the mere click of a button, you can upload a file which a CNC machine will use to cut the your house parts out of, out of plywood and ship back to you for your, uh, to assemble on your site if you've been lucky enough to get your hands on one. It's very slick, very detailed, very well designed, but conceptually at least, it's just machine uh, finished bits of timber piled up on site, a sort of kit of parts if you like. Um, and in that sense, conceptually, it's not so very far away from uh, uh, industrialized balloon frame construction that's been building most houses in North America since the, the mid 19th century. Now you might think that I sound like a bit of a Luddite when it comes to construction, that's not the case. And in fact one of the things I'm really looking forward to next year is the chance to work with an old acquaintance of, of our practice, Lucas Hickman Smith, um, with a chap called Paul Magnum, who's been out in New Zealand for the past five years building houses to develop a timber frame system he's working on called um, GM2. He built a, a, a prototype house using the system for his, his family home in Danbury in Essex before he left back in 2006. Um, it's a rather modest but rather elegant system based on uh, post, posts and beams, um, which means it needs very little foundation in the ground. Um, it has a, a laminated timber column and standardised lengths of, of beam uh, based on a 1.2 metre grid which coordinates with plasterboard and plywood sheet sizes. The four-way connector where the beams meet the column is very slick, but essentially it's just a, a big wooden construction set. And will be very useful in the self-built uh, environment. And that's what I'd like to finish on briefly, because I think that the other thing I'm very excited about for next year is, is self-build. Um, in the UK, we only produce about 10% of our new homes using self-build or, or self-commission, but that puts us right at the bottom of the league table in Europe, and in fact the rest of the, the, the sort of Western world. Um, and the government is very keen that this should change and has been working very hard over the past couple of years with the National self Build Association. And in fact, at the beginning of last year, the new national planning policy framework, the top level of policy in the country, included specific policies to make self build happen. Traditionally, the market in the UK has been dominated by what we call the sort of grey pound empty nesters, if you like, the grand designers. But the government's very keen that that should be widened out to more, much more normal projects, including uh, self build as a form of, of affordable housing. Local authorities have been very slow on the uptake, but we're very lucky uh, to have uh, um, a, a very active MP, uh, Richard Bacon, who's pushing hard on this. And South Norfolk have just got some money out of the central government to set up their first self build register, so watch out for that. 
And even more exciting, on the north side of Norwich, beyond green, have a 3,000 home development that received planning permission this year, outline consent, and they're looking to bring forward literally hundreds of service self build plots over the next decade. So again, if you're interested, watch out for that. And then in summary, the future of housing, well, I, I really hope on a personal level it's much less to do with architects and tricksy construction and imaginative design, and much more to do with normal people, hopefully some people in this room, having the chance to make their own home of the future.